This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. For more books from Gary North that are free and downloadable on PDF format, please visit GaryNorth.com slash freebooks. The title of this book is Millennialism and Social Theory, published by Institute for Christian Economics, copyright Gary North, 1990. Chapter 12, Our Blessed Earthly Hope in History. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Hebrews 8, 3-11 In principle, this prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah 31, 31-34, has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It has been fulfilled definitively. It has not yet been fulfilled progressively. This is analogous to Christ's perfection which is imputed judicially to each new convert as the legal basis of his regeneration. This definitive fulfillment must become progressive in his life. He must run the race, fight the good fight, and persevere to the end. This is also true of the prophecy of the transformation of human hearts. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Similarly, the church must persevere to the end, preaching the gospel in the expectation that God will eventually bring this prophecy to pass in history across the face of the earth. This is the Christian's blessed earthly hope. The Continuity of Jesus' Heavenly Enthronement Jesus the High Priest is in heaven. Jesus the King of Kings is in heaven. He must stay at God's right hand until the end of history. His presence at God's right hand in heaven is the sign of his sovereignty over history. He will not return physically to earth until his kingdom is fully developed in history, thereby ending history. His timing can be derived from the word until. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 24-28 This is Paul's amplification of Psalm 110. A Psalm of David The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Psalm 110, 1-2 How long must Jesus remain at God the Father's right hand? Until God the Father makes his enemies Jesus' footstool. 
Psalm 110, 1. How long will Jesus reign? Until God the Father has put all enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Jesus, therefore, must remain at God's right hand until history ends. So a literal reading of the two texts demands. Are dispensationalists really committed to a literal hermeneutic? Hardly. Their principle of interpretation is this. Literal, except wherever inconvenient. This passage, along with Matthew 13, on the continuity of God's kingdom, is the key passage for postmillennialism's rejection of premillennialism, just as Isaiah 65.20 is the key passage in postmillennialism's rejection of amillennialism. There shall be no more thence in an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. Because postmillennialism is true, Christians have two blessed earthly hopes, one historical, the other post-historical. The blessed post-historical yet earthly hope is the end of history, the last judgment, and the transition to the post-resurrection consummation of the already existing new heaven and new earth, 2 Peter 3, 10-13. But first, we should pray for and work toward the historical fulfillment of the already existing new heaven and new earth, Isaiah 65. This is the blessed earthly historical hope. There is a heavenly hope, heaven after death. This is not what is commonly called the blessed hope. The Work of the Holy Spirit What do we have at our disposal that can be used in the historical fulfillment of the blessed earthly hope? What we have, above all, literally, is Jesus Christ sitting enthroned at the right hand of his Father. He has sent the Holy Spirit to empower us. This was crucial and remains crucial to the empowering of Christians in history. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. John 167 7-11 The Comforter is, of course, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit maintains ecclesiastical and therefore also historical continuity. He was not sent until the three judicial discontinuities between Christ and his Father were completed. These judicial discontinuities are now behind us. These three discontinuities are more important than anything else in history or eternity. Everything that has taken place since then, or will take place in the future, has been or will be an extension of these discontinuous judicial events. What were these cosmically crucial judicial discontinuities? First, the completed transaction of Christ's death on the cross, sin's full payment to his Father. Second, his bodily resurrection, his visible testimony of redeemed mankind's victory over the second death. Revelation 20, 14-15. Third, his ascension to the right hand of his Father, his enthronement as both High Priest and King of Kings. The completion of these three judicial discontinuities led to the next major historical discontinuity, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent in power to inaugurate the Church. This was point five of the Biblical Covenant model, succession. Then, a generation later, came the institutional completion of the Old Covenant at the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Covenantally, this was also point five, disinheritance. This event completed the old heavens and old earth. No discontinuous event of comparable covenantal magnitude will take place in history until the second coming of Christ at the Last Judgment. Jesus will remain at God's right hand until then the guarantee of covenantal continuity in history. This guarantees the Holy Spirit's presence with his church in history. A question of continuity. Institutionally, what do we possess to aid us in our work of evangelism and cultural conquest? First, we have the Holy Spirit, who is God. 
This means we are in God's presence at all times. This is point one of the covenant, transcendence, yet presence. Second, we have the three covenantal hierarchical institutions established by God, church, state, and family. Third, we have God's law and his revelation of himself in the Bible. Fourth, we have earthly access to the implements of God's heavenly sanctions, the sacraments of baptism, covenantal discontinuity and a new inheritance, and the Lord's Supper, special covenantal presence and renewal. Fifth, we have God's promise of both historical continuity and cultural victory in history. The premillennialist affirms victory but not historical continuity. The amillennialist affirms historical continuity but not victory. Only the postmillennialist affirms both historical continuity and victory. This three-way division within the church has led to the abandonment of biblical covenantalism. The churches have therefore adopted one of the two rival views of society, organicism or contractualism. Organicism favors ecclesiocracy, unity of church and state, while contractualism favors religious pluralism, the legal separation of Christianity and state. Covenantalism separates church from state and fuses Christianity and state. There can never be separation of religion and state in any system. The question is, which religion? The goal of the biblical covenantalist is to bring all the institutions of life under the rule of God's covenant law. The state imposes negative sanctions against specified public acts of evil. The churches preach the gospel and proclaim God's law. The family acts as the primary agent of dominion. Voluntary corporations of all kinds are established to achieve both profitable and charitable goals. Working together under the overall jurisdiction of God's revealed law, these institutions can flourish. Biblical covenantalism produces an open society. It did in Old Covenant times. It does today. To deny this is to argue that God required a closed, unfree society in ancient Israel. The following unstated assumption is made all too often by anti-theonomic commentators, and it is probably presumed by the vast majority of contemporary Christians. Quote, Israel was a tyrannical nation, unquote. But it was the other pagan city-states of ancient history that were closed, not Israel. In a biblically covenantal society, there will be one law for all residents with respect to the imposition of negative, civil negative sanctions. Exodus 12:49. I have called this system Athanasian pluralism. When this kind of corporate judicial subordination to God takes place, society can expect God's corporate blessings. This is the only foundation of long-term positive feedback in history, from victory unto victory. This is the vision of compound ethical growth in history. It is basic to covenantal postmillennialism. How to Overcome the Continuity of Evil God's kingdom and Satan's are locked in mortal combat. Both kingdoms seek continuity. Both seek victory. Neither is ready to surrender to the other. But the terms of battle, like the terms of surrender, are covenantal. This is not a battle that will be decided in terms of political power or any other kind of power. It is not a power play. It is an ethical battle in history based on rival covenantal commitments. If it were a power play, the conflict would have ended in Eden. There are, however, negative corporate sanctions that are applied by God in history to his covenantal enemies. These sanctions are applied because of corporate covenant-breaking by people in history. He breaks the continuity of corporate evil. He may replace one society's corporate evil with another society's corporate evil, but he does not allow the compound growth of the same social evil. Meanwhile, he shows kindness unto thousands of generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. This is God's compound growth process for covenant-keeping in history. Little by little, with occasional discontinuities, God's kingdom expands over time. Negative Corporate Sanctions 
Because we have no biblical examples of the imposition of God's positive historical corporate sanctions apart from the imposition of negative historical corporate sanctions, it is difficult, foolish, to predict with confidence that the millennial reversal away from humanism and toward Christianity will take place during an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity. The more common condition of man is to forget God in times of external success. Success creates pride. Pride leads to forgetfulness and the claim of autonomy. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall utterly perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 8, 17-20 We live in an era of unprecedented prosperity. The average resident of an industrial nation lives longer and more comfortably than kings did a century ago. The air conditioner alone has made a major difference in productivity. At some price, residents of every climate can experience the 80 degree temperature that is most conducive to high economic output. Can we legitimately expect a discontinuous movement of the Holy Spirit in the middle of economic and political continuity? Will large numbers of covenant breakers be persuaded by the message of the gospel apart from some social disruption that calls into question the sovereignty of whatever God they worship? We have no example of this in church history, and none in the Bible, with the exception of Nineveh, which feared imminent judgment. If the churches continue their present evangelism programs, should we expect a major cultural transformation? Only if God intervenes into history in a discontinuous way. But if he does this, the churches will have to learn to do things differently. They will be inundated with too many new converts who need too much attention. What is needed today is a preliminary transformation of the church worldwide. But this is also unlikely. What would prompt a change apart from either the pressures of a worldwide revival or the coming of a calamity? Churches are like other institutions. Successful programs, by conventional standards, are hard to change. While unsuccessful programs, even if successfully altered before a worldwide crisis, are too small and isolated to serve as immediate models. The time of model testing will probably be lengthy. The Threat of Being Swamped Only specialists in the early history of Darwinism know who Fleming Jenkin was. But Charles Darwin knew. Jenkin, an engineer, asked a devastating question of Darwin, one which neither Darwin nor his followers could begin to answer before Mendel's work on genetics was rediscovered around 1900. Jenkin asked, How can the single member of a species who alone possesses the unique biological trait that will better enable it in its progeny to survive ever be able to overcome the huge numbers of the existing species, unless almost the entire species die off immediately, leaving the one uniquely endowed member as the dominant survivor? Its offspring will be forced to mate with the conventional members of the species so will their offspring. The unique attribute will then be swamped by the conventional attributes of the species. Lorne Isley summarizes Jenkins' position. Quote, Jenkin set forth the fact that a newly emergent character possessed by one or a few rare mutants would be rapidly swamped out of existence by back-crossing with the mass of individuals that did not possess the trait in question. Only if the same trait emerged simultaneously throughout the majority of the species could it be expected to survive. End quote. The answer that Mendel's laws of genetic variation provides is that genes can be recessive, but they do not get swamped out of existence. This raises another question the statistical likelihood of a positive genetic mutation. But Jenkins' point was on target in 1867, as Darwin knew all too well without Mendel to bail out Darwin's theory of natural selection. A similar problem faces the church today. The churches of the world 
present so many different models that not one of them has attained anything like universal acceptance. No one evangelism plan seems to work everywhere. There is no agreed-upon vision of the future, let alone a common program to deal with it. The Church International is rather like that species that Darwin said was no longer most fit for its changing environment. How can one lonely member change the species, even if it does possess the unique characteristic that would give it its heirs a competitive advantage in the new environment? Here are two solutions. First, the Holy Spirit may change large sections of the church in a brief period of time. Institutional discontinuity. Second, it may be that certain churches will be ideally suited to certain cultural environments, so that when the Spirit at long last moves, he can move into many cultures simultaneously without changing all the churches to resemble a single model. This is my presumption. The third possibility is Darwin's original view. All the other competitors will die off, leaving in command of the environment the heirs of the original mutant. This, however, takes many generations, both biologically and institutionally. Men's institutions do not change rapidly except in cultural cataclysms. The three questions. When anyone wants to make a major change in his goals, he needs to ask himself three questions. What do I want to achieve? How soon do I want to achieve it? How much am I willing to pay? The faster you want to achieve it, the more you will have to pay. It is like building a retirement portfolio. The longer you have until retirement, the less capital you need, given a fixed rate of compound growth, to begin with. Alternatively, the higher the rate of compound growth, the later you can wait before beginning but there are always trade-offs among time remaining, the size of the capital base, and the rate of growth. The modern church believes that it has very little time remaining. It also knows that it is being swamped by its rivals, secular humanism, occultism, Islam, cults, and all the rest. It has a small visible capital base, in every sense. Buildings, influence, money, dedicated personnel, training materials, etc., what does the modern church conclude? Not very much can be accomplished. It has no vision of either compound growth or a long period of growth. Its leaders say to the members, What we see today is all the church will ever get in history. In contrast, the postmillennialist sets his sights very high. The conquest, transformation, of the world, spiritually and therefore institutionally. He can take two approaches. One, Continuity with lots of time. 2. Discontinuity soon, followed by lots of time. Continuity. He can think, slow growth but very long term, little by little. If so, he must hypothesize that at some point in the future all covenantal rivals stop growing or shrink. They die off. Christianity then wins by slow attrition. But what about the six billion people already alive today? All the other millennial viewpoints dismiss them. It's, sorry, Charlie, to about 5.5 billion of them. More if the second coming is delayed. This is at the very least cold-blooded, if not actually callous. But the pure, little-by-little -little post millennialist has the same problem. He thinks that there is a lot of time before Jesus Christ comes again. What will happen in the centuries ahead to all of these people and tens of billions more of their biological heirs? Is the compounding process working today to fill up hell? If things do not change, and change soon, yes, for a long, long time. He too must write off today's billions. Discontinuity The postmillennialist therefore prefers a massive historical discontinuity, but not one outside of the familiar historical processes of evangelism and church planting. He wants God's positive historical sanction of personal regeneration on a scale not seen before in human history. Yet he knows that in all previous cases, such positive discontinuous historical sanctions have come only during, or shortly after, extensive corporate negative sanctions. Wycliffe began the Lollard movement only one generation after the bubonic plague had disrupted the West as nothing ever had before, 1348-50 and two generations after Europe's three years of famine, 
1315 to 17, Luther was successful because of the culture disrupting syphilis that had been brought back by Columbus's crew and the other world sailors, a negative sanction. The invention of the printing press, a positive sanction, and the threat of the Turks, a negative sanction. Also, the Reformation was cut short by wars, the Counter Reformation, and the rise of the Renaissance rationalism and magic, both at the same time, and sometimes in the same men. Each of the great wars has secularized society, from the Crusades to the present. Wars are bad times for morality in general. There may be no atheists in foxholes, but there are few Christians on shore leave. So what should we consciously expect? Pessimillennialism says, the same as ever, muddling through with billions lost eternally. But what should we work toward? A massive covenantal revival. How can we do this? By prayer, fasting, hard work, tithes and offerings, charitable works, Christian education, and pulling the TV plug to give ourselves back 20 to 40 hours a week for more productive uses. Yes, a few tracks would be useful. Maybe some pamphlets, too. But be sure that they have tear-out mail-in sheets and orders blanks, please. Never violate North's prime directive. Every piece of paper should sell another piece of paper. There is continuity in history. There is also discontinuity. The Holy Spirit provides both. Strategies. Russian versus Guerrilla. Russia has fought its wars the hard way in the 20th century by massing huge armies of under-equipped men and then throwing these men against the enemy's front lines. Wave upon wave of them die. Eventually, the enemy army suffers a break in the lines and the Russian general is supposed to order his troops into the breach to cut the enemy's army in half. In contrast, the guerrilla has limited resources. He has to wage a war of attrition against invaders. His tools are the tools of low-intensity warfare. Sniper rifles, landmines, spies, propaganda materials, confidence in his cause, and an extremely long-range time perspective. He needs to proclaim the moral high ground. The problem for the church today is that it needs a full-scale frontal assault against all its enemies, but it does not have the troops or the equipment. Their millennial views long ago shortened the time perspective of fundamentalists, who were already anti-intellectual, and also the Calvinists, who were not very successful in evangelism, and who had been compromised by rationalism to some extent. The various immigrant amillennial ghetto churches were culturally defensive operations from the beginning, and have not changed significantly. This is especially true of Dutch North American Calvinism. After all, if you have been told that time is short, that the world will not be brought to saving faith, that preaching the gospel to the lost will lead to persecution, and that all of this is predestined by God, you have only minimal incentives to evangelize the world outside your cozy ghetto. Besides, all those outsiders speak with peculiar accents. The fundamentalists never did consider a frontal assault against humanism as possible or even desirable. They did not think that they would be around even this long. But they are still here. So are their enemies, but many times more numerous and now financed by tax money. The public schools have done their secularizing work exactly as designed in the 1830s. The on-campus crime and drugs are added extra features. The better to keep Christians appropriately humble before their masters. It isn't as bad as in our local high school as it is across town so we're generally satisfied. We are forced to adopt guerrilla strategies in most areas, especially anything to do with thought and culture. We publish books, small runs, newsletters, pamphlets, and inexpensive cassette tapes. We conduct home Bible studies. We imitate the early church, not David's Jerusalem. We conserve our financial resources, since we do not have many. A Russian strategy is appropriate only for those with lots of resources, either numerically or through the media. Consider the electronic media. The electronic media have important uses, but for the most part, they are overrated by Christians. The average viewer of the typical TV evangelist is female, 
over 65 years old, on a pension, and supports several programs. Radio has been used successfully only by a handful of specialists, notably James Dobson, who is not a pastor, but who meets the daily family needs of mothers. This kind of ministry is crucial in building a home base for long-term dominion, but it is not sufficient to launch a frontal assault against sophisticated, well-entrenched, tax-financed enemies. Yet Christians seem to think there is something nearly magical about the electronic media. If I only could get a Christian talk show. The more naive Christian leaders say to themselves, well, what if they could? Would their ratings be higher than the primetime schlock that now dominates? Not very likely. Negative Sanctions and the Samaritan Strategy This leaves cultural crisis. What this world needs today is a really big plague, if such a plague would bring men face to face with mankind's impotence in the face of God's judgments in history. An economic collapse would not be a bad thing either, if men learn to rely on the providence of God to sustain them. A little covenantal terror and consternation in history never does any lasting harm to people who are headed for eternal terror and consternation. But terror is not enough. India has had its fair share of famines and floods over the centuries, but there has been no Christian revival and no change of heart. Terror is not enough. There must also be a major positive move by the Holy Spirit. Even those who knew exactly who God is did not repent in the face of God's unprecedented negative sanctions against them in A.D. 70. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation six twelve to 17 They preferred burial by rocks to repentance. Men did not covenant with the Lamb except when moved to do do so by the Holy Spirit's irresistible grace. It is no different today. Such events, though never happen again on the same order of covenantal magnitude, can happen to any nation just as they happen to Old Covenant national Israel. The whole land has rejected Christ and the whole land is being excommunicated. This was the final fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy against Israel the harlot. Quote, the high places also of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come upon their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, Fall on us. End quote. Hosea 10.8 So, the church must prepare for both unprecedented negative sanctions worldwide and an unprecedented positive move of the Holy Spirit. The church must pray in precatory psalms against the wicked, even if their fall means national or international collapse. We must be biblically reasonable in our expectations. There are no known cases of God's widespread positive discontinuities in man's history apart from his widespread negative sanctions. There have been only emotional revivals that accelerated the society's drift into greater cultural and judicial rebellion. On this point, we must display the banner of historical truth. If such crises hit, this means that Christians must be ready to take enormous economic and maybe personal risks, e.g. nurses during a plague, giving of their time and money way out of proportion to what is considered normal. They must be ready to serve. They must be dedicated in order to exercise local or regional leadership. The churches must get help ministries operating now, They must learn the procedures of successful giving. They must learn to recognize the difference between a hustler and a person in need. They must be ready to impart the vision and skills that are basic to personal restoration. They must be ready to make a difference in the local community. They must adopt the Samaritan strategy. There is no other way. 
If the church is not significantly better than any other institution, why should it expect God's blessings in history? The problem is, Christians for over a century have been convinced by the church's pessimillennial theologians and popular writers that the church should not expect God's blessings in history. Consequently, its members see it as not significantly better than any other institution. Christians now believe what they have been told. The Church of Jesus Christ has been, and will continue to be, disinherited by God in history. This is a denial of the plain teaching of Scripture. It is also a denial of extensive responsibility for Christians in history. The Promise of Inheritance Isaiah brought bad news to ancient Judah. God's negative sanctions were coming in history. But after her chastisement, he said, There will come blessings not just for Israel, but for the whole world. These blessings will be based on the world's recognition of the reliability of God's law. When the world at long last obeys God's law, it will escape the ruin of war. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah 2, 1-5 This promise was one tied directly to God's law-based sanctions in history. Quote, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. End quote. This coming of God's judgment in history will bring unprecedented blessings. These blessings are listed in the section immediately following Isaiah's description of the sufferings of the Messiah, Isaiah 53. The message could not be plainer. The Messiah's covenant people will inherit the wealth of the covenant breakers, not just in eternity, but in history. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, Thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. And thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Isaiah 54, 1-3 O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54, 11-17 Continuity and Discontinuity If the amillennialist is correct, these passages refer to the world beyond the final judgment. This inheritance would surely be a peculiar form of continuity. The post-resurrection wealth left behind by the Gentiles will be insignificant compared to the deliverance from sin and sin's cosmic curse. But if these passages refer to the realm of history, as the context indicates, then there is no escape from either 
premillennialism or postmillennialism. Covenant keepers will inherit the wealth and authority of covenant breakers in history. The law of the Proverbs will be fulfilled corporately and individually in history. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Proverbs 13.22 The debate now shifts to the question of the continuity between today's church and the coming millennial era of blessings. Premillennialism, discontinuity, versus postmillennialism, continuity. I have already discussed the reasons why we must insist on such a continuity. Here is my final argument. There will be no negative cosmic discontinuity between now and the final judgment, meaning no removal of the church from history, the rapture. The wheat and tares will grow together in the same field until the final judgment. Another parable put he forth unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But he gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew thirteen twenty four to 30 The disciples were not sure what this parable meant. Neither are today's premillennialists. So Jesus explained it to them. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather together out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew thirteen thirty six to 43 Notice the placement of the harvest. Covenant breakers and covenant keepers will work in society together until the final harvest. When will this be? At the end of the world. There is no possibility that there can ever be a rapture that is separate from the final judgment. The prophesied disinheritance of covenant breakers therefore must take place in history. Why? because covenant keepers must inherit the earth from those who possess it today. Quote, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. End quote. Psalm 25, 12-13. But this inheritance cannot be relegated exclusively to the post-judgment world, as all millennialists would insist that it must be. What value would such an accursed inheritance be in that perfect world. Some value, there is continuity between this world and the next, but not very much. The main continuity is ethical, lessons learned in history, not economic. So, title must transfer before the eternal disinheritance of the lost. The problem today is that the church is totally unprepared to inherit, let alone administer, this inheritance. Christians have been taught that covenant breakers lawfully and disinherited covenant keepers from the day of Adam's fall and Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension have not altered this covenantal disinheritance. Neither has the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The covenantal message of Noah's flood, a vast disinheritance of covenant breakers and an opportunity for comprehensive reconstruction by covenant keepers, does not register in their thinking. Neither do Christ's words. 
All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28.18 We should pray for the conversion of covenant breakers. This is the most glorious means of their disinheritance. The old man and Adam die. This will enable God's earthly kingdom to inherit the whole of their wealth when they repent, including their personal skills, which are far more valuable than their material possessions. But this will not happen in history, the pessimillennialists assure us. Here is the cultural message of pessimillennialism. The new covenant is actually worse than the old covenant was with respect to covenant keepers inheriting in history. In the old covenant, at least the theoretical possibility of inheritance was set before God's people, as we can see in the above passages in Isaiah. However, because of the new covenant, we are never told exactly why, God has removed even this theoretical prospect. All of this we have been assured in no uncertain terms, by the pessimillennialists. Calvinist pessimillennialists toss in the doctrine of God's predestination just to wrap up the case. Arminians, in this unique instance, assume that the Calvinists are correct. Conclusion A meaningful, culture-transforming spread of the gospel is unlikely to happen without the crisis. The churches are not ready for either a crisis or the harvest. They have little incentive to change. They do not even think change is necessary. Most of them believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. The others hold to one or another pessimillennial view. They have no developed body of materials on social theory. They will therefore have to learn what to do when, one, they have no moral alternative before God, two, they recognize that they have no moral alternative, three, God removes the false alternatives anyway. 4. They switch their millennial viewpoints. And 5. They actually obey God's law. They will resort to on-the-job training. They will have no choice unless they begin to change now. We will then see the sudden appearance inside the churches of men and women who can be productive in the midst of crises. It is not possible to know in advance who they will be. But to enable them to rise to the top, churches will have to learn to decentralize. They will have to allow the creation of new areas of service within the organization, probably self-financed from the offerings above the tithes of the members. We can imagine such responses in a flood of short-term emergency. I am not talking about a short-term emergency. I am talking about a new way of life for at least a generation. The bubonic plague forced this in 1347-48, to and it returned generation after generation for over three centuries, until the last major outbreak in London in 1665. The next year, London burned to the ground. It will be a time of despair for billions of people. This is the softening up process that has always been necessary in advance for widespread repentance. Will the crises come? Let me ask another question. If crises do not come, and women continue to execute 50 to 60 million unborn infants a year worldwide, what does this say about the God of the Bible? If this level of transgression does not bring massive negative sanctions in history, then the random news common grace amillennialists are correct. The sanctions of God are ethically inscrutable in history. And if this is true, there cannot be any explicitly biblical social theory that would differentiate a covenant-keeping society from a covenant-breaking society. God's kingdom would be aborted by Satan in history. An economic crisis would be ideal. Few people would die, but millions of people in the West would be filled with fear. They might then turn to God for deliverance. The false god of this age, material prosperity, would be publicly dethroned. Its prophets, the economists and politicians, would be scattered. The reigning paradigms of this era would be broken. In such a crisis, a new worldview could become dominant but it would have to present a comprehensive, consistent social theory to deal with the nature of the crisis. Neither amillennialism nor premillennialism can offer such a theory. Must the crises come? No. It is conceivable that God will launch his era of millennial blessings by adopting a unique, historically unprecedented technique, covenantal revival apart from widespread negative sanctions. We should not assume that he will do this, but he might. 
This would produce an unprecedented disinheritance inheritance. The transfer of the assets of today's worldwide satanic kingdom directly to God's kingdom by means of billions of individual conversions to saving faith. Save souls and assets. I personally pray that he will do this, but he does not answer all of my prayers favorably. We need a great revival. What kind of revival must it be? A controversial one. The theologically conservative Presbyterian leader of the 1920s and 1930s, J. Gresham Macon, said it well in 1932, four years before he and his associates were expelled from the Presbyterian Church USA for their non-compliance with that denomination's growing theological liberalism. Quote, The presentation of that body of truth necessarily involves controversy with opposing views. People sometimes tell us that they are tired of controversy in the church. Let us cease this tiresome controversy, they say, and ask God instead for a great revival. Well, one thing is clear about revivals. A revival that does not stir up controversy is sure to be a sham revival, not a real one. This has been clear ever since our Lord said that he had come not to bring peace upon earth, but a sword. End quote. The curse of God in history against his church would be this. He will bring neither the crises nor a covenantal revival. This would maintain the original satanic disinheritance, from Adam's fall to the present. It would mean that the incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ in history were culturally irrelevant divine discontinuities. It would mean that the Church of Jesus Christ is merely a rescue mission, Yet it is this historic outcome of gospel preaching that the pessimillennialists defend. They preach Satan's defeat of the Great Commission. If you choose to believe the pessimillennial version of the Church's history, that is your self-imposed burden in life. As for me, I choose optimism. I preach Christ's resurrection in history. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts, where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.